Welcome to another edition of the Impossible Life Podcast. I'm your co-host, Nick Surface, and I'm looking across at a man so aggressive, he speaks threats in his sleep. That's right, friends. The former Navy SEAL. <laughs> Garrett Unklebach, a man who redefines the term sound sleep. I think, uh, I think you're the only one that has that experience. Nick. You just speak threats towards me? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm never around you when you sleep, so I don't know how I would know that. But, uh, you know, anyways, that could get weird. All right, so today on the podcast, uh, this is a special episode. We have a guest with us that I'm very excited to talk to. Uh, we've said this, I don't even know how many times, that we'd like to talk to a sleep expert today. And, G? Today's the day. Today's the day. We got Dr. Michael Grandner with us. Uh, so, Dr. Grandner, first of all, welcome to the Impossible Life Podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we are thrilled. I'm like selfishly, I'm just really excited to hopefully learn from you and uh, get a better night's sleep. We're big on like just getting everything that we can get out of life and personal development. And obviously, if you're not sleeping well, uh, it's going to impact you. So, real quick for the listeners, let me run you through Dr. Grandner's uh, bio. A warning, this is incredibly impressive. So I'm just going to share this with you so you can get the idea of, of just how much of an expert Dr. Graner is. So Dr. Michael Graner is a licensed clinical psychologist, which I love. He's a director of the Sleep and Health Research Program at the U of A, uh, go Cats, in, that's the University of Arizona, and director of the Behavioral Sleep Medicine Clinic at the Banner University Medical Center in Tucson, Arizona. His work focuses on translational sleep research and behavioral sleep medicine, including studies of sleep as a domain of health behavior. We're going to get into this and the development and implementation of behavioral interventions for sufficient sleep and sleep disorders, which is very interesting. His specific areas of focus include downstream cardiovascular, metabolic, and behavioral health outcomes associated with habitual sleep duration and or insufficient sleep, and then upstream social, behavioral, and biological determinants of habitual sleep duration, insufficient sleep, and poor sleep quality. Uh, and he also has the development and implementation of behavioral interventions. He's written books on that. Uh, for sleep as a domain of health behavior. So that was a lot of words if you're not tracking. But uh, if, if all that kind of makes your head spin, just know this. He's currently the scientific advisor to a little company called Fitbit, as well as Casper Sleep, and a number of nutrition companies like Natrol, Night Food, and Smarty Pants Vitamins. He's worked fr he works free frequently with the NCAA, MLB, which we're going to get into because you guys all know I love baseball. Also Team USA, very relevant right now, and the uh, IOC, the International Olympic Committee. He's written a number of books like Sleep and Health and Sleep and Sport, which we'll link to. Uh, you can get those on Amazon. We'll put those in the show notes. And you can learn more about him at sleephealthresearch.com or michaelgranner.com. We'll put that in the notes. And I just want to say I'd highly recommend checking out his website after you listen to this because it has free tools to help you assess the impact of poor sleep, your sleep environment, as well as your ability to control sleep. So uh, I've personally signed up to this stuff. It's very fascinating. I, I got to say, I enjoyed researching you because I was like, oh, look at all these tools. <laughs> so I love that you have all that available. So looking well, forward to it. Thanks for being here with us today. Yeah. No, yeah, thanks. I mean, th thanks for letting me come and talk about this. Obviously, uh, as you can tell, this is something I care a lot about. Yeah. And I'm so looking forward to hearing how you got into this because this is not like something that you that you typically see at career day, but uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of and myself we, and here. And we do like to get into the deep stuff here. So don't don't be afraid to go deep on the topic. Because uh, that's what we explore stuff in a deep way, uh, mindset related, thinking related. And we've been talking about sleep here from the very beginning as a foundation of because really this podcast is about helping people grow and become everything that God's created mm -hmm. them to be. And part of it is your physiology. Yeah. Right. And so if you and a lot of people focus on just exercise or just focus on nutrition. And I've always felt like sleep really is like the true foundation. And you're the one who's going to be the testament to that. So looking forward to diving into this. Yeah. And this comes this is from a guy who knows the extremes of sleep deprivation. So, <laughs> what happens when you don't? You, you and many others. You yeah. and many others. All right. So, very first question. Okay. So, we all know that you need a good night's sleep to feel good the next day, right? No one says, hey, I've got a big meeting. Let's just go out and like trash my sleep. Well, I think people do say that a lot, but, but you know, really? okay. oh, I, I, I hear it all the time of, you know, I mean, when I'm at a conference, and we've got meetings all day, you know, it's, it's not unusual for people to be like, well, let's go out, you know, and, and um, I think, I think we do actually do this more than we think where even if we know something is important, you know, we might prioritize other things over sleep, but I didn't mean to interrupt, but no, I, no. I think, I think we think about doing that. I think, but I think it, it, it you know, good sleep gets interrupted more than we even realize. Yes. And I'm so glad you said that because we're so big on what we call highlighting blind, blind spots. And we're, I feel like as humans, I, we're bad at I cause like and what, effect. It's like <laughs> what we can do with sleep is it's like, you know, you need to work out yeah. four or five times a week. And what if, you know, you normally work out for 45 minutes? You're like, oh, well, I, I want to make it to that lunch meeting today. So I'll just work out for 30 minutes. 
you can probably get the same close to the same quality of workout in 30 minutes as you can get in 45 minutes just by changing up some intensity cut your sleep by 30% right. in a night. Yeah. <laughs> and I think people will try to make right. that kind of exchange with their sleep. Oh, I'll just give up an hour or two of sleep. It's not that big of a deal. Well, yeah. that's a good point. And so we're big on highlighting that. And so it's interesting to hear you say that, but so, so we know we're, we're establishing that it's bad on to, if you want to feel good the next day, you need to have a good night's sleep. But what, what you've studied this both short term and long term. So what are the effects of a bad night's sleep on our physiology our social skills and performance that, that we might otherwise misattribute. So one way to think about this is that sleep is foundational to our biology. It's sleep isn't something we do because we enjoy it, because we're healthier when we do it, because it feels good. We do it because it's a non-negotiable biological requirement. We sleep for the same reason we breathe air and eat food. It's as, as much as we may or may not enjoy it, we, we do it because we have to. Mm -hmm. And we've done it every day of our life, and except, you know, some all-nighters here and there with some exceptions, but more or less we've done it every day of our life, and so has every human ever. Mm -hmm. um, and not only that, we're not the only ones who sleep. And actually, a lot of people will be surprised to know that most of the most of the unraveling of the genetic codes of how sleep impacts health and all this stuff actually starts in fruit fly research. It's actually fruit fly genetics that we use to identify the sleep and circadian genes, which tell us where to look in mammals, and usually they study in mice and, and, and rats, and then that tells us where to look in humans. But every, almost every advance in human sleep genetics starts in fruit flies because their sleep-wake system is shockingly similar to ours. It is... A, it is the the sleep-wake regulation systems have been around for a very long time. And, and as much as they've changed and gotten more complex, a lot of the basics are kind of the same. That, you know, most animals are either awake during the day or awake during the night. They pick one, right? Yeah. And, and one of those two has their primary sleep period. And in that sleep period, there's certain things that your body does more efficiently when you're asleep than when you're awake. And it's predictable, and it's based on the clock, and there's all these things. And the reason it exists that way is because evolution figured out a very long time ago that with, when life is a sprint, it's short. Hmm. And the way to enhance survival is to not try and do everything at maximum intensity all the time. Mm -hmm. um, a, a way that I like to think about it is evolution figured out a long time ago, it's much more efficient to change your car's oil and refuel while you're not still driving it. Mm -hmm. um, you can theoretically do that. I mean, we could invent technology to make that happen. It's just, why don't we? Well, it doesn't make sense. It's mm -hmm. actually, it's, it's the expense and effort and risk required of refueling your car while it's running is just not worth to just pull over for 30 seconds. Jeez. And, and that's way more efficient. And that's how I like to think about sleep, where there's many things that are going on in the body. That there's no, maybe the, there may or may not be any reason why we can't do them when we're awake. It's just, it's way more efficient to do them when we're asleep. Our body knows this, and it's known this you know, way back in the evolutionary tree, and it hasn't really changed because it works really well. It's just, I mean, anyone who has a pet knows that humans are the only animals that stress out about sleeping, hmm. right? We're the only ones who stress out about not getting enough time to sleep because we're trying to do other stuff. Not because we, have a, we, we don't know how to sleep well. It's that our, our bodies were built for it, mm -hmm. but we create this social environment that is that creates incentives for seeing sleep as, say, an unproductive use of time. And, you know, while as, as rest, as a sign of, of weakness or a sign of, or at least a lack of strength and fortitude or whatever, or endurance or whatever, when really it's, it's been with us the whole time. It's supposed to be helping us. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like when you think about training, like when you're, when you're talking about working out, you know, the workout, the effects of the workout on the body don't begin as soon as you enter the weight room and end as soon as you leave, right? right? Like your body keeps doing stuff. Yeah. Um, and one of the key 
things that it's doing is like when you're working out, you're you're putting your body under a certain amount of stress, right? You're you're creating a situation where you're forcing your body to push the limits of what it physically can do with the hope that it will grow back, it will learn from that experience and grow back stronger to better meet the challenges in the future. And that's how, that's what it's all about. But that growing back process, that learning process, that muscle memory, the, the, the rebuilding, the repairing, the meeting, the understanding what the needs were of the day and preparing what the needs may end up being in the future. When do you think that happens? Right. You know, the, the, you know, in in some ways, working out without sleeping is just injuring yourself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 so you're talking about what are all the different effects it has. The main effect that not sleeping has is it robs your body of its ability to do the maintenance work that it's expecting to do, it's planning on doing, and it's built to do mm-hmm. in that way. And so what you know, it's like you don't have to change your car's oil exactly when your car tells you to do it, but the further you deviate from that. Yeah. The more often you deviate from that, you know, you might reduce the life of that car a little bit. And then, you know, if you, you know, don't do the maintenance you're supposed to do, fine, you're not going to be on the side of the road every single time, four seconds after, you know, you maybe should do some maintenance. But the longer you push it out, the more you push it, the more likely something's going to break, something's not going to be running efficiently, and, and it'll end up costing you more later. And that's what it is with sleep. And that's why, and I'm starting here because sleep touches so many different systems. Mm -hmm. And so when I say that not getting, you know, not getting sleep will impact your heart, will impact your vascular system, will impact your brain, will impact your liver, your lungs, your Mm -hmm. kidneys, your, you know, your memory, your emotion regulation, your immune system, you know, it's not a coincidence that it does all of these things. Mm-hmm. It's because it's, it's foundational to how your body works. Just like if you, if you aren't able to breathe, you know, it impacts all these systems too. Yeah, very good. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail. So, so you found that there are some, like you touched on some of the detrimental long-term effects. Uh, you had something in your body that stood out to me. You said that you can pretty much look at life, like life duration tied to sleep mm-hmm. duration. Yeah. Please tell me about that. That's- yeah. So actually, this finding uh, that, that sleep predicted longevity, that's been around since actually the earliest study that I could find was 1964, I think. And it's, but no one really knew what to make of it at the time. We didn't really see sleep as, as a big part of health. We were looking at people who were interested in diet and exercise and smoking mostly <laughs> and alcohol use. Yeah. And, and for decades, it kind of flew under the radar, but like every few years, a new study would come out where they would track a population over time and look at like, okay, well, what are the health metrics that are predicting outcomes in this population? Well, let's take a look and see what we got. And and lo and behold, every time they measured something about sleep, and it was usually just, eh, how much sleep are you getting? Or like, eh, how good or bad is your sleep? Even if it's a crappy kind of non-specific question like that, it seemed to predict outcomes even Mm -hmm. controlling for other stuff in the statistical model. So it's not just because people who aren't sleeping are sicker or maybe older or maybe whatever uh, or or more sedentary or anything. It was that even if you control for all that stuff, the people who... Now, most of the studies came from how much sleep are you getting? Not that that's the best metric, but that's that was the easiest one to get. So that's what was asked the most. And when you have people who, on average, say they get six hours, five hours, or even less, they, on average, tended to die sooner. If you mm-hmm. followed them up over time, they were more likely to die within that time period than people who were getting seven to eight hours. Interestingly, even nine and more hours, you saw that as well. It's not necessarily that more is always better. Okay. Good. Um, right. Just like everything else, you can work out too much. You can drink too much water. You can, right. you know, there, there's no, there's nothing in this universe that doesn't exist in balance. And, you know, there, the people, if you're getting 10, 11 hours of sleep, especially out of 24 hours, I'm not saying that, that that's as bad for you as getting four hours. But the question is, 
you're in a risk group. Why? Why are you getting 10 or 11 hours? And one of the things we find, not to dwell on the long sleep, because that's usually not so much the issue, but what we find is a lot of people who say they're getting 9, 10, 11 hours as working age or older adults. I mean, teenagers, they need 9, 10 hours. That's a different story. And even younger athletes might need a little bit more. But, but if you're getting 10, 11 hours... Is there something wrong with your sleep that's keeping it shallow? One right. of the most common things we see, especially in um, athletes who are getting a lot of sleep or feeling very tired, like they just feel like they just can't get enough sleep, it's because they have undiagnosed sleep apnea and they don't even know it because they don't have the normal risk factors. Or the other thing I see in athletes all the time is athletes are a lot like veterans where, where there's a lot of chronic pain, um, mm. a lot of stress. And these are the things that they're carrying into bed with them that keeps their sleep shallow. So, so the amount of sleep isn't, isn't always, doesn't always mean amount. Sometimes it means quality. So the people who say they get four or five hours, maybe they're actually getting a little more, but it feels like less because it's stressful. Hmm. So sorry to dance around circles over this, but the, the answer is whatever metric you look at, if you say whether it's sleep duration, sleep quality, sleep regularity, sleep timing... Um, you know, any of these metrics, it looks like if you're outside of the range of what we know is probably optimal, it's going to bear out in pretty much any health outcome you look for. And if you follow people long enough, you'll notice that those people just aren't living as long. Hmm. I have a question for you related to sleep duration. So just like, you know, we're making the comparison to athletes, right? And some, there's certain types of people that they have greater athletic ability. There's certain types of people that can recover e easier than others. And there's some people who don't have much athletic ability and don't recover very easily. Uh, speak to the different, because I've, I've seen some research on it. And I've read about it a little bit. But will you speak to the different? Because what I've seen is that there are some people who need less sleep than others. Can you talk about that? I mean, clearly that has to be the case, right? I mean, what else in the universe in nature is this is what it should always be? I mean, right. everything has a distribution, right? Yeah. There's, there's pro most people probably need within an hour or so of seven and a half, seven to seven and a half hours, somewhere in that range. Like that's where the, the most of the curve is. Right. Is everyone in that curve? Probably not. There's some people who might need more sleep for optimal function, and there's some people who need less sleep for optimal function. But a couple of things. Number one is need sleep for what? So it, a lot of people I see say, well, I'm getting five, six hours, and I'm doing just fine. Well, maybe you are. But the, that wasn't the question. The question is, could you be? are you impaired in any way? Well, maybe you are impaired. Just... Your level of impairment is good enough for you right now. Maybe actually improving your sleep would actually make you better. Right. Um, and, and also, there's another dimension in here of resilience. Just because someone needs, say, seven hours to be optimal doesn't mean that they may or may not be resilient to only getting five and a half or six for a week or two with relatively little impairments. And it takes time for things to catch up for some people. For some people, you know, one day and they're falling apart. For some people, they can be a little more resilient. Actually, that resilience looks like it increases with age, actually. Hmm. Um, like the older you are, actually, the little more resilient you are, even if you feel like it's less. Um, Another dimension to think about is amount of sleep for what? Well, what if you need seven hours for cognitive function, but six hours for your immune system and five and a half hours for your metabolism, but you need eight and a half hours for your memory or something like, hmm. you know, there's so many different functions and the number of hours, it's like, it's like nutrition where it's like, how many calories do you need? Well, there's a minimum amount of calories you kind of need, but it's really, it's more about what's in those calories. So like you can get duration of sleep, but have it be shallow and not as restorative and helpful, or you might be able to compress sleep and make it more efficient yes. um, and actually get more out of it. And so, so sleep people, it's really hard to nail us down because we keep waffling in terms of what's the metric. Cause sometimes right. we keep talking about duration because it's the easiest to measure, but it's not necessarily the number that we should always be focusing on because sometimes it's a good metric and it's something easy to wrap your head around. But, you know, people could be getting, say, seven hours and they might be fine or they might not be. And seven hours measured how? The, all the guidelines and everything I'm talking about here 
is in response to the question, on average, how much sleep do you get? This vague, nonspecific, imprecise question that's super messy. And as a scientist, we hate questions like that. But that's the only way to get that information in a million people. Um, so what should... When you're looking at wearable data, it's different. Yeah. Wearable data will systematically be 30 to 60 minutes less than the answer to that question. Huh. And remember, the guidelines are based on that question, not wearable data. So when people say, well, my watch says I'm only getting six hours, do I need to get it, make it tell me seven? Not necessarily. How do you feel? Um, do you feel like it's about seven? And if so, maybe what it's, the wakefulness it's picking up isn't what's predictive of the outcomes we care about. Yeah. So is that Nick and I are both obviously big fans of of Whoop, and we use ours, which I know is a cuss word for you as a Fitbit guy. So yeah. no, no, not at all. I am not brand loyal. They ask me questions and I answer them. Um, right. I, I I I I remember the Whoop guys when the company first started. I've talked to them. Um, I've talked to. I've worked with some of the Aura folks. I've worked with a okay. bunch of different companies. I'm I, I am not. When people ask me what's the best device, usually my answer is well, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, so whoop is totally fine as, as, as a device. I think the sensors and the technology and the sleep wake detection are totally fine. Some of the other metrics we could talk about, um, but it, for what it does and for what it's, what it's good at, I think, I think the technology is totally fine. With, with all the different components, you know, there's obviously some sort of gen genetic component. There's, there's an environmental component. There's a demand component, you know, what you need to use sleep for. What should people be looking at to say like... You know, you can look at your, you can go get a DEXA scan and say, I'm, I'm either fat or I'm not fat, right? I'm hel I, can have a, I can have my organs looked at, see if I'm healthy or not. I can get an MRI, see if I have cancer or not. How, what's the, the instrument or data that people should be looking at to say, I'm getting good sleep or I'm not? That's a good question because it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's more like nutrition where it's saying, is my diet good or not? It's like, well... Okay, well, I, so 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 what are the way I would think about it is think of sleep across a few dimensions and just check them off. Number one is duration. If right. I asked you on average how much sleep are you getting, are you saying at least about seven hours? If you did the math, maybe it's a little under, but to be totally honest, the risk start seems to start around six. We don't know much about six and a half, so I don't worry about that too much. Um, but do you feel like it's enough is really a question. Number two is, how is the quality of it? Do you feel like it's shallow? Do you feel like it's broken up? Do you feel like, does it take you a while to fall asleep? Do you struggle with it a little bit? Um, the next question is the timing. Is it, is it regular? Right. Um, is, or is it highly variable? Is, it, is, is sleep a moving target? Or is it pretty predictable and your body can, can bank on it and, and therefore be optimally functional? And is it mostly in the time of your day where your body wants to sleep? So everyone has a biological night when their body wants to sleep. Where exactly that biological night is in the 24 hours differs from person to person. So when I look at a clock and see midnight and my brain sees midnight, someone else may look at the clock, their eyes see midnight, but their brain says, oh, it's only 9 p.m. Why are you trying to go to bed now? Like they're night owls, especially yeah. people in the ages of like 16 to 25, that, that decade people are biologically more likely to be night owls where your actual biological night is shifted later huh. in the 24 hours and then it starts drifting back. Um, so is it actually the time when your body wants to sleep? A lot of people will say that, especially younger people, especially athletes who have to get up early to train, they're like, well, my body doesn't want to go to sleep until midnight, but I got to be up at five. Yeah. Um, and so I tried to go to bed. Well, I want, I know I need eight hours. So I'm trying to be in bed at like 8 PM, but my body can't sleep. So now I have really bad insomnia. Mm -hmm. And so this is where the timing comes in. And so we might need to work well on napping. We might need to work on shifting your, your, your phase, which we can do. So to backtrack a little bit, think about duration, think about quality, think about timing, think about regularity. And then the last uh, the other dimension to think about is how's your day? Yeah, And there's a difference between sleepiness and fatigue and tiredness. Those are all different things. And, in, and, and for people who can't tell the difference, ask someone with insomnia the difference between sleepiness and tiredness. Right. You're very tired, not very sleepy. Yeah. If you find yourself losing consciousness where your head's drooping and your eyes are drooping, that's a sign that you're starved for sleep. Hmm. Um, just like if, you're, if you find yourself reaching for food when it's not mealtime, why? 
are you deficient in something? Is this, what, what's going on here? Same thing is if you're not able to maintain focus and, and wakefulness during the day, that might be a sign that something's going on under the hood. And if you can check off all those boxes, I wouldn't worry. And, but if there's any one of them that you could potentially work on to optimize, they're all good targets. Yeah, very good. Now, I, we're going to dive into some more of that, but I got to ask this question. This is very sp- specific to our podcast. So Garrett was a Navy SEAL, as you know, and I don't know how much you know about Hell Week, but in Hell Week, they run uh, they stay up from Sunday to Friday, uh, and they run over 200 miles, mostly with a boat on their head in five days, work out around. Yeah, it's brutal, right? And during the week, Garrett always tells the story that they basically get two one-hour blocks of sleep. So you start on Sunday night, you sleep. Uh, You go from Sunday until Wednesday. You nap for one hour on Wednesday, and then you'll nap for one hour on Thursday. And they always told us that the reason they brought in those one-hour naps was related to, like, brain damage. So, yeah, is that – do you know – is that – do you have any insights into what that – what could find that kind of damage? Um – not really. I mean, really what that is, essentially what they're doing is, I mean, it's under periods of sleep deprivation. And I get it. Like, you know, if you're in the military and you're in an operational environment, you need, it's essentially testing or at least trying to build that resilience because, you know, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't need that resilience all the time, but you at least need to know what happens when you need to tap into it when the time comes. Fortunately, I don't have a job that requires that, but, you know, so, so, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend that for everybody, but I get it. It's a, it's, it's an occupational issue that there will, there may be times in your career where you're going to have to function essentially a couple days in a row and the one hour naps, what they do, the reason why, um, the reason why that's at least required is because just very briefly the sleep you get in the very beginning of the night that's where you get sort of the sort of some of the deepest most restorative sleep and mm-hmm. that's also the stuff where if you go the longest without it you have you have the biggest problems maintaining wakefulness and focus during the day it's sort of like um you know it's sort of like the you know the first you know the first part of the meal where if you if you eat nothing for 24 hours like you can you know maybe you're you're more hungry than if you're like well at least you had a few snacks so it's something um so i guess the the idea of some of the naps is it's unrealistic to expect people to be awake the entire time but at least what is the minimum amount of sleep we can give people in a couple days to make it so they're not completely useless and that's probably it and then there's probably a recover afterwards yeah, well, there's certainly a lot of recovery afterwards. What was really interesting was when I finished Hell Week on Friday, um, we finished around like 1 p.m. I didn't go to sleep until almost 9 p.m. <laughs> I was like, I, I made phone calls. I was, you know, I was kind of a little well, well, well right, because that what you were you were outside of your biological night, even though you were very sleepy, hmm. you were still in your biological day, and your circadian rhythm was kicking in at that point, where it was like where it was saying. I know you're really sleepy, but hang in there. It's daytime now. Do daytime stuff, and when the time comes, you know, you'll probably sleep faster and better that next night, but in the middle of the day, you were kept up. What was crazy is when we would, uh, during Hell Week, and obviously you go all through the night, I remember um, like multiple through the nights where we'd, there'd be hours where I don't remember, like, you'd be running and your eyes would close, and your body keeps running, but it's like my brain just went to sleep for five or yep. two. <laughs> and there would be times where like I would wake up from a little five second nap while I'm still running and I'm trying I was trying to think back I'm like I don't I don't remember two hours ago where right. I, how I got to where <laughs> like your body like my body kept going but my brain was like I'm I'm on minimum mode so so people say that that um you know if you don't get enough sleep you'll die <laughs> and um that comes from a the fact that it's sort of a biological requirement anyway but um, th- there's animal studies that were done back in like the seventies and eighties where they, if they kept them awake indefinitely, they died. Like their, their bodies sort of stopped functioning normally. It was, it's, it was, and like weird, bizarre stuff happened to their bodies that didn't make sense, but basically their bodies were, you know, the, the organs stopped working properly. Humans don't get that because, um, what happens is if you keep a person awake long enough, they will, they will fall asleep. Um, it's, and the, the, the analogy I like to use is, is breathing. Like you can, and, and, and 
you know, in the Navy, you, you've experienced this where you can only, no matter what, you can only hold your breath so long <laughs> that, that there, there will come a time where your body will say, look, I know you're holding your breath. I know that if I breathe right now and I gasp for air, I will probably drown because I'm underwater. Mm-hmm. And I'll hold off as long as I can, but there will come a point where your body gets gets to the point where it says, I am going to override my own survival because the mechanism that forces me to do this has gone too long. I can't, I can't hold it any longer. And you will take that breath underwater. And sleep is the same way, where if you go too long with too much sleep pressure... You know, you, this is why you have fall asleep crashes behind the wheel. It's no one's, no one's like, hmm, I think I'm sleepy. I know I'm driving, but let me just take a nap right now. It's, yeah. it's your body will take that on consciousness, whether you like it or not, no matter what you're doing, if you go far enough out. And that's why, I mean, it takes one, a second and a half to change over lanes in, in a car. And even if you wink out for a couple seconds, sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. And so when they say lack of sleep never killed anybody, I say, well, kind of, but we don't know of all the times when someone fell asleep doing something and they took that metaphorical gasp of air, even though they were still underwater, like yeah. behind the wheel of a car or, or operating something or, or, or in, a, in an extreme situation. That's why with athletes, one of the things we always say is if you're about to have a few days in a row of maybe your worst sleep of the year because you're like in the Olympic Village or it's the World Series or like whatever. Yeah. Bank as much good sleep beforehand as possible so you can build as much resilience. You're, you're coming from a place of strength huh. and, and you have a buffer as opposed to like you're running on fumes and now you even have no fumes left. You know right. what I mean? Can you give us a hype. So, you know, say I normally sleep seven hours and I got a weekend coming up where I've got back-to-back events, I'm going to sleep three or four hours, three nights in a row. What should my sleep be coming into that? Seven, seven and a half. Normal. Balance. Balance is fine. I mean, it's sort of like if you're in balance and someone bumps into you, you can you can recover relatively quickly. If you're barely hanging on and someone bumps into you, you fall over, right? right. And yeah. if that seven hours you normally get leaves you in balance you don't need more balance if anything more sleep might make you a little more groggy Hmm. um for someone like that it's just it's about balance it's not about it's not so much about reserves in the tank think about it as the person who are how firmly and how securely are you planted if you're going to get hit right and and you know you can't plant extra firmly by putting on heavier boots or something, you know, like you can't, I don't know, I don't know how the metaphor works, but you know what I mean? Where, where if you're in a secure, firm place, it's more about, can you go a week or two in a row of pretty much of, of, of getting the best sleep you can. So it's like, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, fast or, or have bad, a bad diet for a week or so, you're going on vacation or whatever, um, eat really well for a couple of weeks beforehand. And at least you're coming from a place of strength. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So on, on this topic, um, you know, I've read some about this, but I'm not the expert. You are. A lot of people have heard, heard the term of sleep debt, right? Yeah. You don't get sleep, you accrue debt. How, what does the payoff on sleep debt look like? What is sleep debt? Yeah. So sleep debt, it's less like financial debt than, than we think, which is good news. <laughs> yeah, because if I have financial debt and I don't pay it back, not only does it get worse over time, even with me doing everything good, um, but I have to pay off every dollar and then some where, where with sleep debt, it's not really the same. It's debt in that, you know, every day may be a new day, but like the previous day feeds into it. If think about it like diet, right? Um, one way I like to explain this to people is when people ask how much sleep do I need on the weekend to make up for getting four or five hours of sleep during the week? And I say, that's like asking, how much salad do I need to eat on the weekend to make up for eating nothing but cheeseburgers and pizza all day and all week? So it's like, well, that's better. I mean, at least you're not eating cheeseburgers and pizza every day. Yeah, it's a a step (laughs) positive forward, yeah. But it's not, they don't cancel each other out. Right. Like, you did what you did, and you're suffering the consequences of it, and now you're trying to get back to some sort of semblance of, of... balance 
And and that's all, so. But what's interesting with sleep, though, unlike diet, where with, with diet, like you know, if you eat like crap for a while, two days of eating better isn't really going to change very much. Right. But what's interesting with sleep is there's this really interesting phenomenon where if you've been sleeping like crap for a while, two nights of good sleep will feel great, and your your cognitive and physical performance after just a couple of nights of recovery sleep will be essentially as if you have no impairments Wow! In, in most cases. The issue is you're not fully recovered because if I sleep deprive you the next night, you're actually going to pick up where you left off. You're not going to gradually start getting worse again. Right. It will be bad. You weren't actually recovered, but your body's like, okay, good. All right, we're back. It's, it's like you're back on track yeah. and you're back in balance. And once you're in balance, you're okay. And so that's the thing. Even if you've had a month of the worst sleep of your life. Give yourself two to three days of recovery and then just go back to your normal schedule. You you may not it may take time for that for whatever was done to your immune system or your brain or whatever to fully recover as if it never happened. But it will feel as if it never happened and you'll function as if it never happened at that point, mostly. Very good. Okay, so I wanna uh we've covered a lot. Like and we've we've jumped around which has been amazing. <laughs> Um, no, no, it's okay. I feel like I'm learning a lot. I, what I really want to do for our listeners and also for ourselves is I want to really try to understand as much as possible the factors that impact sleep quality. So if I said to you, okay, you could design the perfect sleep, sleep routine you know, because you know the factors, what would it be? First of all, um, my perfect, the perfect sleep routine would be regular in that – in that I wouldn't have a fluctuating schedule. And I know a lot of athletes, they have this issue where they're like, well, they have to be up at five, but only on Mondays and Thursdays, you know, like yeah. that kind of a thing. If I was, if I was going to create an ideal schedule, it would be predictable because the body and the brain love predictability. They mm -hmm. love the, the ability where, where it's sort of like the way I explain it to people is you have two people on like a football field and you have the receiver who's trying to catch the ball. And they need to, and if they can predict where the ball is going to land, they're going to catch it more often. Yeah. And let's say you have the person throwing the ball, is always, they're, they're, their arm strength is pretty constant. They're always going to throw it a certain amount of distance. And so the person catching it knows about where to stand. Now, if the person throwing it is constantly in motion and moving it, then the person catching it it's harder for them to predict where the ball is going to land. But if the person essentially throws it about the same distance from essentially the same place every time, the person knows where to catch it and where to be. And, if, and, and this is sort of how sleep is because you have these experiences during the day, which is sort of the throwing, and you have at night, which is where you do the recovery and reorganization and repair and integration and all that stuff, which is the catching. And you want to keep those things separate. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can predict and prepare for that for that to happen you can optimize that process but if it's a constantly moving target it's less efficient so regularity is key the other thing i would do is actually um i rather than focus on a morning alarm i would focus on the evening hmm, i great. would make it so that you don't need a morning alarm because you know, so the, the way I do it for myself is I think, what time do I need to wake up in the morning? First of all, what's the latest I could actually wake up just in case I sleep in or something? What's the latest I have to wake up? And that's where I set my alarm for. But right. when is my actual target? And then I count backwards. I know about, you know, how much sleep do I need? Budget in how much time I think it'll take me to fall asleep and, and have a little bit of time awake during the night because nobody has 100% sleep efficiency. And then I think, okay, that's what I need to like start trying to sleep. Okay, what do I need to do, think backwards in terms of wind down to be ready to sleep at that time? Hmm. And so thinking backwards, so actually the time that's most valuable to me is when in the evening do I have to stop work? Right. When do I have to put stuff down? When do I turn off whatever show is actually going to get me interested and excited and switch to a thing that I would have no problem shutting off if I needed to? Hmm. And th what that does is, is, is it's, it gives me the time and space I need to be able to wind down when I need to, to get to bed at my target, to fall asleep in, in enough time where I wake up naturally and, 
at the time that I needed to wait and wanted to wake up anyway, and I never cut anything short. I don't need to cut anything short. I get what I need. I think of sleep as a commute that way, where yeah. it's like, how much time does it take to get to work? I don't think, well, let me do everything I need to do, and then I'll leave when I leave and just hope I get there on time. Yeah. You know, you have to count backwards. It's it's not, you know, the the the, the laws of the universe say I can't teleport, so I have to budget for that time. Yeah. And and if you think of sleep that way as as it's essentially your commute to tomorrow. You're like how much time do I need to get there? I mean, I can speed and race 120 miles an hour down the road, but there's risks involved in that. So so on that speeding and racing down the road, you could get there faster. Right. What's an acceptable level of variability in that? Right. Of course, I, ideal. Yeah. Ideal, yeah. Go to 10 p.m. every night. But if some nights I go to bed at 930, some nights 1030, is that a dangerous level of vari- variability? It, for, for, for an otherwise normal person, an hour or even maybe a little more of an hour of fluctuation in either direction, I don't stress about. I wouldn't stress about that. But like if it's varying by more than that regularly, you might look into why. And yeah. especially if your if your bed wake time are vary are more than if your bedtime if you I listed out all your bedtimes from the past fourteen days and there's a greater than three hour gap between the earliest and the latest, I would think, okay, what's going on there? Like is there is there an issue with regularity here? Yeah. So like for example, if some mornings you woke up at five AM, some mornings you woke up at eight thirty, that's a problem. I would say like well why is there was was that the goal and and if if maybe the 5 a.m. is the aberration but if it's if things are moving cuz the other thing that happens is when people are really tired then they sleep in mm-hmm. then they sleep in now they're waking up sometime especially if they're like natural night owls cuz they're younger adults anyway then they're waking up at 9 10 like 11 sometimes even later then they don't have the 16, 17 hours needed to build up enough sleep pressure to get to sleep at the time they want to sleep. So then the late wake-up time created a later bedtime the next day because they shifted themselves all over. And now they start drifting later and later, and then they feel out of control. Um, yeah. So real quick, so you touched on something about giving yourself time to wind down and having something that you could put down. What I noticed you didn't say, because I mean, there's there's all sorts of stuff about like avoid blue light, like two hours before you go to bed and wear blue blockers and you know all these different things that people do. So it sounds like you're saying, look, it's not about the, the screen. It's more about can you just turn your, be like, ah, I'm good to just turn this off whenever. Like, are you controlled enough? Yeah, that- I mean, on the one hand, there is a biology to light. So when light hits the eye, it sends a signal to the clock in your brain that says daytime. Right. And what that does, it does two things. One, it tells the clock, hey, if, you think it, if you're not sure whether it's daytime or nighttime, I'm telling you it's daytime. And I'll, get, I'll tell you why that's relevant in a second. The other thing it does is, irrespective of that, it sends a message to pineal gland and says shut down melatonin production, at least while the light is, is, is shining. Hmm. And so you want natural melatonin production at night because that's what sends the nighttime signal to your body. It's not, people think melatonin is a sedative. It's not. You give melatonin to a nocturnal animal, it wakes them up. It's, hmm. a, it's a nighttime signal, not a sleep signal. But, you, but, but your body uses that nighttime signal to help prepare for sleep under normal circumstances. Um, so you don't want to suppress that melatonin. And in the evening, when your body's not sure where nighttime is, it's going to be looking for signals of nighttime. And so giving it a bunch of light straight into your eyes at night confuses the clock. That's why it doesn't matter much in the middle of the day, because you you know it's daytime. But that but bright light first thing in the morning wakes you up way better, because it's giving a strong daytime signal when you want a strong daytime signal. So the light, and the, the issue with the blue light is, it's actually the blue-green frequency of light is what triggers that clock. So a red and yellow light actually are totally ignored by the clock. They're not seen as daytime signals at all. Um, that's why the blue blockers are red and orange, because they, you can still see visually, but the clock, as far as the clock's concerned, it's dark. Hmm. Um, so all that's true, but realistically, in our world, it's less about the light. Unless there's a lot of environment, unless you have bright lights on all around you, the light of your screen isn't really going to be doing much anyway. If, you're, right. if you have bright overhead lights in your room, 
and you dimmed the light on your screen, you're still getting plenty of light in your eyes, first okay. of all. But then also, it's what you're doing. I mean, a lot of the stuff that's on screens isn't there to relax you. It's there to keep your attention and sell yeah. you stuff and get you outraged and get you to click on things. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's like everyone's wrong on the internet, and they have to know how wrong they are, and you have to like explain to them all the ways that they're wrong. Like it's an engagement, and then all the algorithm stuff. That's not there to help you sleep. Right. It's there to maintain your attention, and so. A lot of people in my world say, put down your screens 30 to 60 minutes before bed. I'm a psychologist, so, I, so my understanding of human behavior is when you tell someone to do something that's probably not reasonable or feasible for them to do, and then they can't do it, your advice was unhelpful. Right. Um, rather, I'd say, like, fine, in an ideal world, maybe do that. But like in this world, maybe what you should do is at least be cognizant of what you're doing. And a good rule of thumb I like to have is... If an alarm went off and it said, put this screen down now or turn this show off or whatever, it's like you have 10 seconds to turn it off. Could you do it? Hmm. If so, it's probably okay. If it's like, no, 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 I need another 10 minutes or whatever, it's probably right. too mentally engaging for that last 30, 45 minutes before you're going to go to bed. Yeah, that's helpful, man. Okay, and, and sticking along the lines of, of looking at these impacts, so are there individual fact, individualized factors that show up in different ways? Because some people will have, like what you're describing, I would think that would ha make somebody have trouble falling asleep. Whereas some people have trouble staying asleep, and I'm definitely more in the latter. I'm more inclined to wake up way earlier than I want to. And so I'm curious. Yeah, yeah there's, there, the things that drive difficulty falling asleep and difficulty maintaining sleep are different. So the things that often drive difficulty falling asleep is you're carrying a lot of mental energy into the bed with you. Right. Either that's because you haven't given out yourself enough time and space to wind down, or you're trying to go to bed too early, or there's too much stimulation, or what often happens is you've done that so many times, getting into bed creates activation in your body and brain because it's predictable. Yeah. And you have a you, you condition yourself to wake up. The bed becomes the wake up place and it's it's even not even in your conscious control and you have to deprogram that. That's usually problems at the beginning of the night. Problems at the middle of the night usually are around the fact that your your natural sleep drive builds across the day and dissipates while you sleep. But the first half of your night is going to dissipate more than 75% of your sleep pressure. Huh. And so, but your sleep pressure is going to be high in the first few hours, but it's going to be relatively low for the second half of the night. What keeps you asleep is that you also have low wake drive. And so you don't have a lot of sleep drive, but you don't have a lot of wake drive either. And right. so it'll, so sleep is sort of allowed, not pushed. In the beginning of the night, sleep is pushed, but the, the second half of the night, sleep is more like permitted hmm. unless something's in the way. Now, everyone wakes up during the night. The average adult wakes up, what, eight to ten times on average per night. They just don't remember. And if yeah. anyone has a wearable and they look at it, you'll see lots of little awakenings. Yeah. Those are all legit. That's yeah. fine. They're harmless. Everyone has that. If, you're, if your wearable doesn't show lots of little awakenings, it's, pro it's, either, it's either not good and missing them or it's lying to you because it knows that they're there and they just don't want to freak you out. Uh, but a good device will show you them all. They're there. It's okay. But you'll have these natural awakenings. Now, for people who have, in the second half of the night, especially after about four hours, four or five hours especially, most people have an awakening they may or may not remember. But if that awakening opens the door to mental or physical activity, let's say you have pain, let's say you have stress, right. let's say you have something else going on, now you have activation, but without a lot of sleep pressure, that mm. makes it harder to fall back asleep. So the solutions there are different, where the awakening is probably unavoidable because it's a natural awakening. The problem is reducing that activation in the middle of the night or reallowing sleep to happen. Um, sometimes we can suppress it and get people back to sleep quickly. Sometimes actually the solution is, well, your snow globe just got shaken up. You're going to have to wait for that snow to settle again before you're going to try going back to sleep. So the best thing to do in those moments is actually take a break. Like, mm -hmm. I, like I clearly, my body is not clearly going to sleep right now. I might as well take a break and try again when I'm ready. As opposed to trying to force it, right. which just adds more energy into the system instead of takes energy away.
So that's so good. On that, I've read about a term, and I feel like I fall into this category. And tell me, you know, how much science this is or not. I've read about a term called sleep inertia. Yeah. Like guys in the yeah. military would call me Lunesta because I, <laughs> I, could, I, didn't, I, I wasn't narcoleptic. I could go to sleep wherever I wanted. You couldn't stop me from going to sleep. Like I, I, one time I slept on a bed of like metal rollerblade wheels, which is like the, <laughs> where they load the cargo in on, on this, uh, which is like a sliding floor. I went to the only place I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. Everyone else just stood there. So There's nowhere to lay down. I, I laid down and went to sleep. And then also, like, I can, you can wake me up in the middle of the night, tell me something, and if I'm not awake for more than three or four minutes, I can close my eyes and go right back to sleep. Yep, exactly. So people, any awakening that's less than about three minutes is not remembered. Just huh. telling you that. And, and so, like, when people say, oh, I woke up, turned my alarm off, and rolled back asleep, um, why did I do that? It's like, well, you, you were awake, but you, didn't, you weren't fully conscious and you weren't forming new memory for that time. So you need at least three minutes to sort of remember. That's why all those little awakenings are there, but you don't remember them. Uh, sleep inertia is a process in the brain that when you have an awakening, it's a natural process that assists you to get back to sleep. Because we have all these awakenings, you know, again, evolution figured this out a long time ago, like... If you're up, you know, you wake up, no bear, go back to sleep, How? what is that process? So people who are very light sleepers, where any little sound sort of wakes them up, actually a lot of people will wake up during this stuff. It's just they remember it because those awakenings are lasting more than three minutes because their sleep inertia is, is dampened in some way. Sleep inertia is what protects your sleep. It insulates your sleep. It's also what makes it hard to wake up in the morning because your sleep inertia says, still nighttime. I got you. Go back to sleep. And then you're like, no, no, no. I need to start my day. And your sleep inertia is like, no, 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 you don't. It's still your nighttime. You need more sleep. I'm going to help you. Uh, you won't even remember this. Mm. And, and it's a natural process in the brain. That's also why I say, you know, usually you don't want to caffeinate immediately when you wake up because a lot of people caffeinate as soon as they wake up and they think it's the caffeine that's waking them up, but it's really just the natural sleep inertia slowly draining over 10, 20, 30 minutes as they wake up. The best way to deal with sleep inertia is let it help you during the night, but if you need to get up and get going, um, get used to like don't don't hit a bunch of snoozes i mean that's just that's just tempting sleep inertia to 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 keep to get used to turning off an alarm what you need to do is you need to program and train yourself that when the alarm goes off it's might as well be too late you're up feet are on the floor um and that way you can override sleep inertia with light and mm. with movement Right. Movement seems especially key to overriding sleep inertia because it tells your brain, no, no, sorry, sleep inertia. I'm awake now. This is wake time. You hold off. You go away. And it's the movement. It's that oxygen utilization from your muscles that seems to push that sleep inertia away. Hmm. Very, very good. That, that, that's really helpful. Um, so I want, I want to, we got a couple more questions here and then we'll, we'll wrap, but, uh, you wrote a book that works with clinicians in CBT and I, I, I'm a big fan of cognitive behavioral therapy and it deals with people who have insomnia. And what was so fascinating to me is that you have chapters in there that deal with specific disorders like depression, chronic pain, and other common disorders and phases of life like pregnancy and adolescent. So how much does your mindset affect your sleep quality? So a lot of people don't realize this, but insomnia is so chronic so treating insomnia the recommended treatment by any medical organization that has any guidelines at all about insomnia they all say cbt is the recommended first line treatment for insomnia not medications Good. and that's because cbt it's been for insomnia but cbti or cbt for insomnia has been around for decades it works as well or better and has outperformed every medication that's ever been on the market. It's not like, well, I don't want to take medication, so I'll do this thing that may not be quite as good, but it'll probably be safer. Actually, CBT is more likely to help than medications will. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a reason for this, that what chronic insomnia is, and I mentioned this a little bit about conditioned arousal, where there's a million causes of, of acute insomnia, short-term insomnia. Our, our data, uh, when we track people over time, it looks like about one out of every 20 or 25 people will get a new onset of insomnia every month. Wow. For one reason or another. But about 90% of those cases will resolve on their own within days or up to a few weeks. 
once, a, you know, a, maybe one out of 10 of those will become chronic. Mm-hmm. And so then when we look to see what differentiates who will resolve on their own, and insomnia resolving on its own is normal. Like insomnia exists because um, it, it, it's adaptive. It helps us to get through life. It's just mm-hmm. the same reason pain exists. It's there to alert us of an issue. And when we're stressed, our body's like, look, uh, with your ancestors who were running from the bear in the woods when it was nighttime and time to sleep, when they were stressed and their survival depended on it, they were able to push through and they weren't too sleepy. And then they laid down later. Um, and so we have all these mechanisms to keep us awake when there's stress to right. enhance our survival. It's normal. But when we're no longer being chased by the bear in the woods, we should be able to go back to sleep. Right. So, Short-term insomnia is nothing I worry about. Um, It's chronic insomnia that's really the issue. And what differentiates short-term from chronic insomnia seems to be one key thing. And it's when people who have short-term insomnia try to fix that insomnia and and over-micromanage it and overreact to it, they actually create Mm. chronic insomnia. Because what they're doing is they add lots of effort in. They stay in bed for hours and hours and hours, ruminating, not able to sleep. And then what ends up happening is the bed becomes the dentist chair. The bed and, and the act of falling asleep becomes so predictably tied with stress that just getting into bed create stress and yeah. now that stress becomes the activation that prevents you from falling asleep yeah, and it becomes a, a cycle yeah. and actually the original it's like a ball rolls rolling down a hill whether it was pushed or kicked or hit or slapped or whatever who cares what got the ball rolling whether it was stress or pain or whatever or illness or who, yeah. who cares what caused the insomnia at this point the ball's rolling it's gravity that's the issue it's going on its own at this point point. Yeah. and the way you stop it is you actually deprogram that conditioned arousal. You 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 reteach the brain how to sleep. It's more like it's it's CBT, so it has some cognitive elements, but it's actually more like physical therapy for your sleep. It's really and athletes do really well with it because it's it's really a training protocol. You're really retraining your brain to sleep. You're you're training it to do something it's naturally able to do. It can do it. It always has been. But you're yeah. getting this other stuff out of the way and and, te- and reteaching it. So yeah. CBT is extremely yeah. effective. It works in all these different populations, even in pain, even in other uh, shift workers. It's just you have to adapt it and modify it sometimes. Yeah, it works really well, and that's why we're so big on mindset on this. And that might explain why Garrett sleeps so well because he's got a pretty rock solid mind. I'm, I'm being dead serious. He, he, the analogy of the bear in the woods, and so much of the bear in the woods is what we create in our own minds, which is why. Th- is so effective so so looking at things that are not of our own creation um uh, we've also looked at the effects of alcohol and cannabis on sleep CBD, quality. Different things yeah too. yeah yeah so yeah. first of all alcohol alcohol is probably the most used sleep drug in the world um yeah. but it's not a very good one uh, right. it would surprise nobody to tell you that that actually the data show that people who drink alcohol fall asleep faster um and actually maybe sleep a little bit deeper in the beginning of the night uh Unless you're an alcoholic, and actually the sleep effects kind of wear off. But hmm. what they, what they, what people forget about is, as the alcohol gets processed through your system, it be, it gets metabolized into other molecules that end up waking you up. Right. And so, what often happens when people drink before going to bed is the alcohol like helps sedate them, but then is activating, and right. then maybe they fall asleep faster. Maybe they knock out, but then a couple hours later, their sleep becomes shallow and restless, and they just feel crappy the next day. So alcohol, you know, that that's the deal. Like a drink at night after dinner or whatever, a glass of wine with dinner is probably not going to do this if unless you're super sensitive. But it's more like people who are drinking more than a couple, and right. especially closer to bedtime. The, uh, the other thing is... Um, uh, caffeine, a lot of people know about caffeine and sleep, but a lot of people don't realize that caffeine can impact your sleep not just four to six hours later, which is the normal window, but some people who are sensitive, it could be eight to ten hours later that you just don't notice it because it can have a really long tail, um, especially if you're recaffeinating with things like soda that you're not thinking about as caffeinated. Right. Um, so a good way to experiment, like, is my caffeine a problem? Just shift your caffeine, your, your stop your caffeine intake maybe at noon or whatever and see what happens. You don't have to cut out coffee altogether, but just 
take it out within like 10 hours of sleep, see if it does anything, and then you'll know if it's your problem. In terms of, of cannabis, really you're talking about THC and CBD. Right. So the data on THC and CD, CBD are totally different. Um, THC is the one that's more the drug. Right. Um, the data on THC show that on average it can improve your sleep. It can help you fall asleep faster, sleep more restfully. Um, it, you know, a lot of people will tell you this, that it's, 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 it's not a coincidence that a lot of people are using it and they feel like, like it helps them. However, mm. there's a couple of important downsides with THC. One is, is, is that the data bear this out. And clinically, I see this all the time that the effects on sleep start wearing off unusually quickly compared to like any any sleep medications you can develop a tolerance to right but it looks like with thc on sleep the sleep effects start wearing off maybe as quickly as a couple weeks wow. um and then what happens is people start escalating doses to try right. and ch chase effects and and then they're getting more side effects and one of the side effects of thc is it seems like and and it doesn't seem to happen 100 percent of the time but it seems like it's a potent suppressor of REM sleep which, mm. which, you know, if you read about REM sleep, you'll think, you know, REM sleep is super important. It's really important in memories and, and emotion regulation and all this stuff. Um, but REM sleep is very important. Antidepressants also knock out REM sleep. A lot of people don't realize that a typical oh. antidepressant will knock out even more than THC will. And that might actually be how it's helping people. So if REM sleep was super important, how do we knock out REM sleep with antidepressants and people not have bad emotion regulation? So yeah. it's, it just yeah. means that... The brain right. is more complicated than we realize. So I'm not trying to say like REM sleep is the end all be all, but it does suppress it and you may not want that. And actually, as the sleep effects wear off, it looks like the REM suppression does not. And the place where that becomes tricky, especially is when you stop taking it, you get a rebound insomnia. So what ends up happening is people say, well, you know, I used to, I used to smoke to help myself sleep and I'm still not sleeping great, but... It, as soon as I stop, I have the worst insomnia ever, and I'm right. smoking to keep that away. And, mm. and not only that, because of the REM rebound, I have crazy nightmares. So, so like I use THC to keep the nightmares away, when really that was just a withdrawal symptom that would have gone away on its own mm. after a few days or, or, or a week or two even. Um, so that's the problem with THC, where it can be helpful as a short term something or other but long term it's just really not a great option and for athletes in particular the other effects of thc on athletic performance and injury risk are are in my mind enough of a reason especially because we have things like cbt and and, and other other techniques for fixing insomnia that aren't performance impairing yeah. or increase injury risk so if you're use, if you're an athlete and you're using uh thc to treat your insomnia um you know, is it, you know, like you, you might, you might run the calculus in your head versus sleeping pills and, and performance impairment, but there are other things out there too. Um, so there's probably a better option. CBD on the other hand is just, the literature is totally murky. Forget what the ad in the window of the store says. Um, mm -hmm. it's not a cure all for sleep. Actually, most study, there's been a bunch of studies on CBD and sleep. Most of them show no difference versus placebo, that most of it's a placebo effect. Wow. Um, some studies actually show it does seem to improve versus yeah. placebo, and some show that it actually makes sleep worse. It seems to depend on the dose, seems to depend on the timing, uh, and, and it's basically, my take-home message is there's something active there. We don't understand it well enough yet to know right. what to do with it and because just, it, on average it doesn't seem to help. Right. I was going to say, just for those that may be listening and didn't pick up, Dr. Grandner said that CBT, which is cognitive yeah, behavior yes. therapy, helps you, whereas CBD, which is the stuff that... Uh, Cannabidiol, yeah. Oh, there you go. That, so there's a difference. I know we're going to transition to a nutrition question really quick. I want to ask you, um, as we're going from the, the drugs to nutrition, let's uh, pick up on hormone really quick. I know melatonin, very different... You know, it's, it's a supplement. What's the right amount? How much? Yeah, does... yeah. So I mentioned melatonin. It basically sends a nighttime signal. So taking melatonin during the day does very little because your body knows it's not nighttime. Taking melatonin in the middle of the night does nothing really for most people because mm -hmm. your body already knows it's nighttime unless you're not producing it naturally for some reason. We naturally produce melatonin. We rise in the evening, peaks at night, drops right around the time we expect to wake up. So... Where melatonin was used as a treatment, that was developed back in, I think, like the 70s or 80s with blind people. Because um, with blind people, we use light. Remember I was saying we use light to regularize our clocks. Um, 
And our natural rhythm isn't exactly 24 hours. We're not machines. It's actually slightly longer than 24 hours in most people. And we use light to balance that 24 hours out. Otherwise, we'd be on like a 24 and a half or 25 hour day. And what that means, a 25 hour day would mean I wake up at 9 a.m. today, 10 a.m. tomorrow, 11 a.m. the next day, because my schedule keeps moving an hour in the, in the 24 hours. And which is fine until you're waking up at 2 in the afternoon and then sleeping all day. And so we call that non 24 hour circadian rhythm disorder because you're on a non 24 hour schedule. It's almost exclusively in blind people. It takes a third to a half of a milligram of melatonin in the evening to completely fix the rhythms in a blind person. That's wow. it. That's all it takes to get the system to do its job. Now, with sighted people who aren't that sensitive to it because we're getting, we're getting environmental light, slightly higher dose is probably fine. Um, it looks like there's essentially no difference between a half and three milligrams. Higher than three is seen as a high dose melatonin okay. a normal dose we consider a half to three and actually um the time to give yourself that nighttime signal is actually more like four to five hours before bedtime that's actually the better time it's like huh. dinner time um it which seems weird if you think melatonin's a sedative which it isn't it's a nighttime signal so right. and and if you're giving yourself a low dose like a half a milligram or one um what it's doing is it's giving a little boost to the system about an hour or so before it was going to start anyway. Hmm. And what that does is it starts the whole thing. So it shifts you earlier. Yes, you may fall asleep earlier, but you'll also wake up a little earlier because it's, it's a time shifter. Now, there's the higher doses that are more like five that you can take closer to bedtime because it takes a little more to to bump the system because you should already be producing it. Um, and it can increase that area under the curve. Um, if your melatonin was totally normal, then it's, you may not, it may not be doing that much. Um, and for people with insomnia, it doesn't help much because your brain knows it's nighttime and you still can't sleep. That's why melatonin almost never works to fix insomnia. Yeah. Um, and if you take a dose that's too high, too late, close to bedtime, like taking like 10 or more, um, what happens is you still have a lot of it floating around in your system by the morning. And you, so you're getting a nighttime signal at the same time as a daytime signal. And that's why people will report kind of daytime grogginess mm -hmm. because their clock's all messed up. Yeah, um, so, so that's actually the thing. Low dose earlier might be better. Um, and if, but if you are going to take it closer to bedtime, five is usually way enough and more is not more more doesn't give you more of an effect because you're either telling like you can put nighttime in all caps and bold letters and you can make the font bigger by making the bigger dose but the message is still the same to your body and so it doesn't really make that big of a difference i've seen a lot of products that are five milligrams of melatonin and people think well one is good well two must be better <laughs> right yeah it's not a sedative that's why that's why it doesn't work that way it's yeah. it's not a sedative it's a hormone and and there's there's like these critical windows the other thing i should let people know is with melatonin there's a thing called overages and the fda requires by law that if you're selling a supplement that the amount on the bottle has to match the amount in the pill or the whatever but the way the law is written, that match has to occur at the expiration date so that when people have stuff that's been sitting on the shelf, it's still potent. But what that means is the chemists and food scientists have to calculate how much overage they need to put in the gummy or the pill or whatever so that it degrades. Oh. And, and once it hits the expiration date, it hits the target. So what that means is when you buy something off the shelf, it actually might have 30 to 50% more than the bottle oh. says, not because it's lying to you, but because they're actually following the law. Um, some of the smaller companies aren't so careful about following the rules, so I can't speak to them, but at least the larger ones and, and all the ones that I've worked with, you know, they complain about overages because they're like, well, we have to do it to follow the rules, but then people complain that we put too much in, but we can't, we can't say a different number that's on the, that we can't tell them it's 50% more because that's changing the labeling. Yeah. And so it becomes just to, as a point of education, people should know that, you know, yeah. maybe if your goal is taking five and you buy a five, maybe kind of cut it in half hmm. um, or, 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 and then that should be plenty. Yeah. I take a product that's two milligrams and then it also has five HTP and L-theanine to yeah. help get 
green to sleep. Yeah, L-theanine is is you know L-theanine has got tons of data that can help promote relaxation. There's one or two studies on sleep, but it looks like it's helping sleep through relaxation, not sleep per se. Um, and the what was the other one you mentioned? HTP. Oh yeah, 5-HTP. So 5-HTP is for people who don't know. So tryptophan, which is the stuff that's in turkey, but it's actually the same in all meat. The turkey's just got singled out. Uh, it's the same everywhere. Uh, 5-HTP is an amino acid, or not 5-HTP, tr- uh, tryptophan is the amino acid that gets converted into 5-HTP. 5-HTP gets converted into serotonin, and serotonin is what becomes melatonin. The raw material for melatonin is serotonin, and the raw material for serotonin is 5-HTP. So taking 5-HTP, it's like you're trying to build houses, and it's like, it's like delivering lumber. Right. Where, where, where we're taking a tryptophan supplement or taking foods high in tryptophan, that's like having a bunch of logs delivered, where yeah. it's like it's the raw materials that haven't been processed yet, yeah. but now you, can, you could theoretically build more houses. But the difference between taking melatonin and taking 5-HTP is 5-HTP won't increase the amount of melatonin you can make. So you can, you'll only make as much as you're going to make. You'll, you might have leftover wood. Whereas taking melatonin, it's just dumping a bunch of houses in your neighborhood, whether yeah. anyone can live in them or not, or whether they're just extra. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and that's sort of the difference, where 5-HTP can boost melatonin if you can use the boost. But if you can't, if you can't really use the boost, you know, it's, it's not going to make more. It'll just give you more raw material. Yeah. Now, I know you got a call to go to, so I want to be quick here. If this is a, this is kind of a yes or no, and if there's a few, then great. But like, so you've worked with the nutrition companies, obviously, you know, pretty much, it sounds like you know everything about sleep, but are there any food groups that you'd recommend that should be avoided or any types of food that should be avoided that, that, you know, impact sleep? Yes. Um, actually one of the things that we know is, and, and this is going to sound way simpler than you were probably expecting, but the more calories you consume within a couple of hours of sleep, that's mostly just going to get converted into fat. That's not used. Um, right. Even if you get, and if you start feeling really hungry, it means you should have been in bed already. Um, you don't need to, either, your body doesn't actually need the calories at that point. Even if it's telling you it does, it really doesn't. Um, first of all. Second of all, calorie dense food, especially heavy foods in, at night anyway, are more likely to just cause reflux. And a lot of people will have reflux, especially when they go horizontal, and not know that that's what's happening. They just know they have a hard time settling down. Um, Other things, same thing with spicy food. Other things, um, high fiber tends to be good at night. That it's uh, fiber seems to be the one thing consumed at night that seems to be associated with better sleep. The literature on this is still super murky, but I'm, but my prediction is within the next 10 years, we're going to know a lot more about this. The signs are pointing towards fiber as a, as a, as something you want to make sure if you're going to, if you're going to have a nighttime snack or something at night, um, higher fiber, higher protein, lower fat, a little mm-hmm. bit, not no sugar, but little sugar, um, is probably the way to go. Um, and also, if you can put stuff that has more antioxidants in it, because sleep is very antioxidant. A lot of that healing and recovery is happening during sleep. Maybe giving some of those raw materials, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory stuff can help promote sleep. That's awesome, man. That's so helpful. Okay, two more quick ones. And I know I want to give you give you some your time because I know you got another call here in uh, about 10 Okay, so the the second to last question, I, I told you about this before, and I love baseball. Uh, I have done for a long time. I know you've worked with the MLB. I've worked with the MLB in a, in a few different clients and still do. So I'm just wondering, like, you're designing sleep for athletes. You've mentioned athletes multiple times. I've always thought about this, especially for these West Coast guys that then have to go three hours, and they're like, stay, you know, for them, it's earlier. The East Coast guys that go back to the West Coast, and now their their first pitch is at 10 p.m., where they're used to, they're used to being pretty much done with their game. How do you design these like these sleep for athletes that are traveling to time all three times or four time zones in the U.S. and you know different game yeah. time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 tough. And MLB is is unique in that way where they probably play and travel the most when yeah. they're in season compared to anyone else. So the problems we're dealing with are things around travel and how do you perform late? So so so. You're right. That's why actually traveling west is way easier on the body because you're extending the day rather than shortening it. And remember, your day is slightly more than 24 hours anyway. Right. So, so it's always easier to extend the day. But when West Coast teams travel east, they do better. That's because they're playing at closer to the 
their peak performance, not late at night, which is when everyone wants to watch it on TV, right. which is not when you're in peak performance. So actually being earlier in your clock is actually better. Um, and so one of the things I, I'll work with a lot on these schedules is it's, okay, you're going to have this disruption. How do you optimally insulate against it? So sometimes it's, uh, one of the things I stress a lot with MLB players is, is a thing called stimulus control. And I've hinted at aspects of this before, but essentially what this is, is making it so that you have it so that when you get into bed and you close your eyes and you put your head on a pillow and you're under a blanket, your brain's like, oh, I'm in the place where I sleep. And even if my brain is active, I'm going to start drifting off. It's sort of like when you walk into a weight room, even if it's not the same weight room you're always in, you can sort of get into the zone to work, to right. do your workout. You want to make it so that place, that activity is so predictably tied to the outcome you want that even if you're going to bed at the wrong time in an unfamiliar place, you have enough training and conditioning right. that it protects your sleep. So the w one way to do that is besides having a really good and predictable routine that's travel and to take with you, it's if you're not able to sleep, you, you, you get out of bed and you wait till your, your body's ready, um, things like that. And you train that religiously so that even when they're on an off schedule, they can take that with them. Sometimes I have them take stuff with them where even if they're going to be in all these hotels or whatever, at least they have the same pillowcase or the same right. something that, huh. can, that can create that response. So insulating their sleep, protecting it as much as I can recognizing that I can't, I can't rewrite the laws of physics, but the, the best we can do is try and protect against them. Huh? Okay. That man, that's, that's interesting. That, that's I, when you said it, it started to make sense as you were saying it, but uh, I did, I didn't know that. It's a little mean. counterintuitive. It's yeah. not about trying it is. And, and it's because it, it, it's about not trying to do the impossible and, and butt heads against uh, it. So it's like with shift workers, how do you get a shift worker to get equally good sleep during the day as, as you can at night? You kind of can't. So right. rather than have that be your goal, let's try and make their sleep during the day as well as you can and, perform, and, and reduce the, the impairments at night as much as you can while they have to be on a shift work as opposed to trying to fix the problem that isn't going to be fixed. Very good. All right. Very last question, and we'll let you get. Uh, how do you even get into being a sleep a sleep expert? I'm just. Oh, oh yeah. It's <laughs> well, because sleep is awesome. And so when um, when I was a college student, I and I was a psych major. I um I always thought dreams and stuff were cool and then I had a friend who got a job as a tech in the sleep lab on campus and I was like wait we have a sleep lab on campus how did I not know this and they're like yeah it just started up and the guy who the faculty person who they hired to to uh, who they who's running it is going to be teaching a course next year I'm like oh I totally want to take that and so I took the undergraduate sleep and dreams course at the University of Rochester and I loved it and I'm like, this is, I just felt like sort of, this is the world I belong in. And I volunteered to work in the lab and, and did an independent study and, and turned into an honors thesis. And he's, and, and the guy who ran the lab said, Hey, you know, you should, if you apply to PhD programs, like you can do sleep research and I can help match you to mentors in PhD programs that do sleep work and sort of went from there. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, Dr. Granner, thank you so much. You yes, shared it. You. I'm going to be unpacking this one and, and changing my routines. And you shared a, a wealth of knowledge. Guys, we'll link to everything once again in the show notes. Uh, so you can go check out Dr. Granner's free sleep tools, his books, you know, all the different things. Got a lot of things out there. So thank you so much again. Uh, and we'll, awesome. we'll speak to everybody else soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.